is Big Man Tyrone, and you're about to watch the MTG Cabal cast with your hosts, Wode, Thirsty, and Reptar. Sub to us on all your podcast networks at MTG Cabal cast and YouTube. Alrighty, guys, welcome to the newest episode of the Cabal cast. So, for today, we've got kind of an interesting conversation, and that's going to be centered around the holidays, which are obviously happening now, Christmas right around the corner, and how it affects the LGS. Now, I've worked in a few LGSs, so we've sourced some questions from the community to basically have a Q&A session. Let's get started. Yep. So the first one, to me, seems kind of obvious. When do conversations about the holidays start? When do the murmurs at the LGS level kind of begin and like, all right, we got to start thinking about it. Let's get ready. So one of the interesting things about the holiday conversations is like typically it's in October. Okay. It kind of centers around release schedule, though. So whatever the main set is of your like magic, if that's your main game or Pokemon that releases prior to the holidays yep. is typically when we've started the conversation like, hey, this magic set's coming out, uh, you know, in late October, early November. That's going to be the last big thing what do we want to start doing for the holidays now? How do we want to go from here? Because once this event is over, we don't have anything except the holidays. Let's get it started. Okay. So that's when conversations start. And is that when planning in earnest starts? And I don't just mean orders, but, you know, store layout, which sometimes change for the holidays, uh, staffing, etc. Yeah, that's one of the biggest thing for that. And it's, you know, you start thinking about what you're going to do fund wise when you're going to place your orders. Uh, do you want to overcommit to certain products over others? Like, you know, one of the main things is, you know, again, if you're theming it around your main bread and butter as a store, mm -hmm. be it comics, Pokemon, magic, D&D &D, or games workshop, whatever. It's all right. Uh, now that we have this planning in place and we want to start looking at what we're doing, are we changing our layout? Do we want to, you know what, there's going to be more people walking in probably. You can't really sell grandma singles, right? Yeah. So do we want to decrease our singles representation for the holidays, at least the facing, and go for more sealed product? Or do we want to, you know, hey, we're not going to have as many people playing Warhammer. Do we want to set up a display on one of those tables with like a mock battle? so people can see what these miniatures that they're buying for their kids look like because mm -hmm. that's more commonly something that a grandma can say oh uh, you know timmy told me he needs a blood knight dreadnought whatever that means and you can say oh it looks like this you know here's what this looks like to try to get them engaged in it and that's usually again mid early october sometimes it is a little bit later into november Yep. Just depending on business, because WotC may drop two sets within a month and a half of each other, and you're kind of left reeling. And there may be a third one coming around the holidays. If shipping happens, who knows? You can always get it on Amazon. Okay. So they all kind of start around the same time, but some conversations might drag on longer than others, or you might re-up for things like layout. Um, yeah. Now, allocating of funds. So that's that one is it kind of differs from store. So if the store is very hand-to-mouth, Yep. It's going to be, all right, so our pre-release makes our next three months, which is a common thing for LGSs, where your pre-release is your big event. Based on how your pre-release is, that's going to determine, all right, how many players did we have? Cool. We know who our active players are. We know who's committed to coming here. We know who's going to show up for weeklies. And you can kind of get an idea of what's going on event-wise. Yep. And in that case, you'll tend to start allocating funds for that stuff almost immediately. And in terms of when you're buying it, what has historically happened at the LGSs I've been at is we stock everything huge for the holidays in one order and write it out for the next few months. Okay. Just make sure, like, all right, we've got everything. And if we sell out, that's an awesome problem to have. Yep. You can go to the distro and try to get more if it's there. Uh, but you, typically we've tried to have, like, you know, a Black Friday blowout where we just have a ton of stuff in stock and you come in and you see like this giant six foot tower of booster boxes for whatever set mm -hmm. or whatever new box is out from games workshop or here's a D&D &D display with all the limited edition silk cover versions of the books uh, and you try to hit the ground running from the beginning and then just re-up that stuff as you go through the season and sell out. Okay, so you mentioned 
the the pre-release and you know taking those funds and allocating would you say you allocate that to magic or do you want to like spread that because there are games that just kind of operate like a rope you know warhammer yeah. just comes and goes with the releases your books are steady for the most part those being like the warhammer universe stuff D D, etc you might see some bumps when new stuff comes in but otherwise they're going to rope they're not going to be like a pre-release no and i i think uh, one of the big things is especially around the holidays you know what we've done is you know say typically your pre-release money goes into magic and that's just how it is okay uh around the holidays what we've done is like all right you need to know your market you need to know your holiday traffic yep. are we getting more of our regular players or are we getting timmy's grandma who comes in or an aunt or uncle or someone who just says hey my kid really likes D D. what have you got for me and in that case you know typically if you have a lot of foot traffic you may put some of those funds in dungeons and dragons or game workshop or that stuff that is just ignorance friendly so to speak and that's one of the big changes that i've noticed you know lately from talking to vendors is now uh for the holidays what people have started doing is putting singles on amazon because you can wish list them uh, okay and all of a sudden amazon is ignorance proof you can just send them the wish list and they can buy whatever and it doesn't matter okay and so in store a lot of stores like i was saying you know they typically kind of cut down on their singles facing and they do go for like all right let's invest in a few more verticals you know we may get a lot of people for pokemon that we only see during the holidays and that's another thing is holidays are kind of unique for your clientele traffic mm -hmm. because you do have regulars that are only regulars during the holidays that you know you're the neighborhood store and i know my kid comes here every week or you know my friend comes here whatever uh what can you tell me about them? Because they're here every week. What do they like? What do they need? And you kind of get, you know, there was one store I was at for a few years, and it was a group of friends every single year. They would never play. They were invisibles. It was always kitchen table. But come the holidays, they would come in and buy EDH decks for their friends. And we knew every year for the holidays, those regulars would come in. Mm. And it's a lot easier once you have that established than when you're starting out. Because when you are starting out and you're allocating for the holidays, it is just throw a bunch of stuff at the wall and see, see what, what sticks. sticks. Yep. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. So a lot of this seems to start in October and really kind of fast track from there. Is October when you would start ordering from distro for all the verticals you want to hit? Typically, yeah, with, you know, the understanding that if we have some product left over from earlier in the year that we just haven't done anything with we're fine blowing it out the door uh you know sunk cost fallacy is something you're going to deal with a lot at the lgs level because some people do it because it's fun and not because they're business people yeah and you know that was one thing we had is all right well we're going to order more product but what do we have that's sitting around that we can like blow out as a doorbuster you know if we have some old pokemon some old magic or you know the last model of whatever imperial models from games workshop that just got a rework yep blow them out the door just get them out of there and i think that's you know typically october is when you start ordering for those mm -hmm. but you keep in mind what you have left over from earlier in the year okay uh and does ordering like stretch through the holiday season or do you want to say like we know by X point in time, we're never going to be able to get at, you know, vertical X or vertical Y. I, I think typically it stretches through the holiday season. This year has been drastically different for us. Um, you know, I, we just got our battle skies restock from fall 2020. Okay. Solid. <laughs> I mean, what, what are we going to do about it? You know, I mean, yeah. that's, that's really all you have. And uh, typically, yeah, you would order throughout, but now the reality is, through demand which has been significant as well as just allocation and shipping issues yep we have to deal with the fact that there's some stuff we're just not getting for the holidays and that's when a great relationship with your distro comes in and your rep because they'll tell you straight up hey look man i know you ordered this six months ago hopefully january mm -hmm. and just them being honest with you is very good i think okay now, when it comes 
to those orders and your main verticals, not all your verticals, your main verticals. Do you want, do you think you like to order at the same level that you did before, or would you shoot for a kind of a, a slanted ordering system? And you mentioned at the top, and this is kind of about this, and this is a sub point I have to this question. Do holiday bundles or sales at the distro product level change anything? And I imagine that's related to, you know, the, this year being weird where we just had two magic set releases, but anything that releases close to the holiday season, does that kind of swing? It definitely does. Uh, Southern Hobby in particular has a not magic release set sale that happens every time a magic re set releases, but they're completely unrelated. You can't call it a magic release set sale. Anyways, uh, that definitely does because there are things, you know, maybe leftover holiday bundles from the year before. There was one year, I think it was 2019, they had Origins Fat Packs on a release sale. It was for Amonkhet, actually. That was on. That was the non-Magic set release sale. Was Origins Fat Packs that were hmm. sitting around, and sometimes it does because there are really good deals there and there is you know promotional product and stuff that they may have extra of that yep. they're handing out for the holidays and it kind of, it can influence that a lot you know obviously you know at this point if they were to say hey we've got spoils super cheap i'm not gonna buy them out of spoils mm -hmm. but if they have some of the challenger decks that are just like sitting around in their damaged bin i may pick those up now you know i you're more likely to get that stuff because that's the kind of thing that you can incentivize traffic with. And like I'd mentioned, you can kind of blow it out the door Yeah. as like, here's our early bird special. We got this stuff on sale from the distro and we've got it on sale for the first three hours. Come get it yep. and have people come in for it. Now, historically speaking, looking back over holiday seasons, would you, you would know, I would assume how your main verticals sell. So if one was a slower mover, like I, I love picking on tabletop stuff because it just seems so polarizing. Amazon exists. Well, well not uh. just that. It's just like what people like about tabletop games is so yeah. polarizing. You know, you have a, a, a 40K group or like a Hordes group, a War Machines group, etc. Not everybody likes everything that comes up. Some people are homers, right? They're just going to yeah. buy everything. Yeah. But if you know that that's going to be operating at a certain level it's going to be flat and it'll it looks like it well the same couple of years would it make sense to reallocate funds towards some of those bundles for other games that you were seeing if you know those are generally speaking higher traffic items yeah that's very common uh and a, a prime example was this year uh so typically pokemon's a little bit slower for us during the holidays mm -hmm. Uh, and we were discussing, let's get a little bit less Pokemon. Yep. Uh, the difference being the celebrations Stuff, yeah. packages happened. So we were like, you know what? Normally every year we go a little bit lighter on the Pokemon, but this year we wanted to go ham on it because that stuff is selling like crazy. Mm -hmm. And that is a conversation that, you know, look, based on our previous years, what kind of sells during the holidays, what doesn't. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like any company, you use your prior sales data to dictate your future sales yep. uh and you know if the sales data says you know what at, around christmas we just do way more with like comics and tabletop cool that's great that's now good. let's do something else yep okay uh, this one's going to be uh, a little different and not really product but still really uh, still related to the lgs staffing conversations uh, increased employee representation expanded store hours throughout the entire so holiday season yeah, so the the one that I will say is store hours don't happen often at the LGS level unless you're in a mall. Okay. Then it's required. Staffing definitely does, especially on the weekends, especially at night. Uh, you know, typically, I don't know how it is for everyone else, in St. Louis, a lot of the LGSs don't open till noon or two mm -hmm. just because their clientele's not there. Uh, so you'll open up at like noon or two and you may have a mid come in instead of just an open and a close. And that is real common. Okay. And it's basically like, Hey, look, you know, guys, we got hours who wants them because some people, you know, especially at an LGS, a lot of them are still in school. 
a lot of them are going to college. A lot of them are still, you know, committed to stuff mm -hmm. or they may just have a bunch of family stuff going on for the holidays. But you'll inevitably have two or three that are like, hey, man, I'll take I'll work all the hours you can give me. Mm -hmm. You know, if you've got them for the next couple months, I'll take them. Yep. And that that's definitely a conversation that happens typically a little bit closer to the holidays. Like once you get into like the first or second week of November, you start putting that bug in people's ear yeah. and be like, hey, look. You know, week of Thanksgiving, we're going to be closed Thanksgiving, but Black Friday, you know, that's when our hours start getting stacked. Yep. Who's going to work and go from there? Yeah, I, I asked because that Black Friday in particular is the only real holiday that I knew where things changed, but that's for personal reasons. There was an LGS that I played at while I was in high school, and I used the term LGS loosely to describe this place because it was a comic shop, but that's where you play yeah. games. They didn't do singles, they just did sealed. And their model was comic subscriptions. But they did a... Uh, they were the first place I ever knew, so this is like early 2000s, that did extended hours on Thanksgiving into Black Friday. But basically everything wrapped up at 1 a.m. And it was increasing percent off until you got to, you know, the final percent between like midnight and 1. Midnight and 1, yeah. So... And I, I think that's also the type of conversation that you start having in October is like, how do we want to do these sales? Mm -hmm. And then that informs your staffing conversation. Yep. Because if you're going to do that, obviously you need people. Exactly. And uh, now we're going to jump back into some of the other stuff we talked about briefly. When does holiday facing start in earnest? Uh, pretty much November. Okay. Uh, for historically that's when it's been for the stores i've been involved with is like all right because a lot of times you know if you've got a local business committee or the neighborhood you're in is like a popping spot mm -hmm. all of a sudden they start decorating in november for the holidays and you're like all right we're going to start our facing for the holidays now yep. because if foot traffic is important for us we want to look appealing and look like we belong in the neighborhood mm -hmm. and if not well you still want to look inviting to the mom and pop people that are here getting presents for little timmy and it's pretty much when november starts you're like all right you know you've probably got one person if not more that are pretty knowledgeable about if not marketing than just like graphic design and can start drawing stuff up for you mm -hmm. and how you want that arrangement made and it's typically like november 1st 2nd that first week yeah you're going with it now what about like window dressing internal and external? Does that usually happen around the same time or because that can be a little more difficult to get to, uh, especially the inside dressing for the front facing stuff? That you typically want to do earlier because you you especially don't want to wait till after Thanksgiving when Black Friday hits mm -hmm. and you've got a bunch of people that are coming and going out of the store because like you said, it's harder to get to. So you don't want to be doing it when you've got a bunch of traffic in your store and you have to move all this product that you're displaying out of the way or whatever display cases so that you can get in there and do it. And typically you're not going to do that like first week. I've known some people that literally they'll go in on Thanksgiving and do it when there's nobody else in the store. Mm -hmm. But you're typically not going to wait too terribly long into the month of November to get that done. Okay. And while we're still talking about facing, does that change as you move through the holiday season, maybe to highlight different deals, different blowouts, different product that comes in? Yeah, uh, it's pretty much like, you know, if anyone who's ever been to a comic shop, here's the staff picks, right? And yep. they change every week. You do the same thing with whatever your highlighted deal, if you have one, is for the holidays. If you've got, hey, look, guys, we got a bunch of D&D in. Let's put this at this shelf right smack dab in your face when you walk in the store. Yep. That's the first thing you see. And that's that happens throughout the holidays as you sell through stuff, mm -hmm. as you change your sales as new products release because let's face it new products are still releasing uh not just in you know collectibles but sports cards comics D D, everything has releases coming out throughout the year mm -hmm. so you've got to highlight those as well yep. so something you mentioned earlier was player spacing and using it to your advantage basically essentially creating the example is creating a diorama on the tabletop space where those you know those guys drop their minis so is that considered a boon or a detractor as you get closer to the holidays, the space in general, because people can't buy what they can't see? I think it's generally considered a boon. And there's there's one shop local to here that I love that does this great every year. So they're near a college campus. So the vast majority of their business is based on college students. Mm -hmm. 
Well, guess who's gone for the holidays? College students. They're not around. They're going home. Awesome. That's fantastic. So what they'll do is during the school year, they'll take, because they have slat wall in the play area, they'll take the slat, the items on the slat wall down mm-hmm. and let people play. During the holidays, all of a sudden that slat wall is used to display product. And, you know, there's no such thing as bad used space. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can use it poorly, yeah. but it's not a bad thing to use the space. And I think it's more important and especially, you know, out here. And again, this entire conversation is based on my experience with an LGS, not anyone else, uh, especially out here in St. Louis. You've seen more and more shops kind of like use that as marketing space. Mm -hmm. And it's not just a place for people to go and play. All of a sudden now their new release posters are up there or they've got stuff for the marvel cinematic universe or they're using something there to promote one of their products uh and that's become more and more common not just around the holidays but year round as well um and i think that's something that you know is a good trend in the lgs in general yeah Uh, now to jump back to uh, orders overall when you're looking at the holiday season you know you're coming up on october you're looking at what distro is making available to you uh, I guess this this has to be done at two, and answered in two different ways. If you're more of a hand to mouth shop, mm-hmm. are, are your order increases, or sorry, are, are your order levels going to increase the holiday seasons? Stay relatively constant, and then same question for a shop that's a little more established that isn't as, as hand to mouth. So uh, this one's kind of the same answer for both. Um, interestingly enough. You know, the vast majority of sales as an LGS are to your regulars. And when you have less traffic with the regulars, which happens a lot during the holidays, Mm -hmm. your orders can actually kind of decrease, uh, especially when it comes to like, you know, draft boosters, for example. We barely ordered any because our players went home and we don't need draft boosters. So we allocated those funds elsewhere. And one of the interesting things is the time that we actually increase orders, tax season, January, after the holidays and into tax season is when we typically order more because people start coming in with that money. Mm -hmm. And while sales are up during the holidays, it's less that you're ordering more, you do order a bit more. It's more that you're specializing your ordering into the verticals that matter during the holidays. Uh, Prime example everyone knows this buy prices dip during the holidays because people are selling cards to pay for gifts it's the same exact principle at an lgs you know we're going to order the stuff that we know is going to sell and if we know it's going to sit on the shelf we're not going to bother with it we may order some just to hold for after the holidays because once you come with your you know gift card or money or whatever you're going to need to buy it but it's you almost wait to like get that stuff in until after the holidays because you want to you know it's the old argument if i had 500 dollars, would i rather spend it on fetch lands or a uc yeah well those fetch lands are going to multiply a lot faster than that uc is so i'll take the fetch lands Mm -hmm. and that's kind of what it's like during the holidays only with other products yeah and i guess this is kind of answered already uh, through just conversation you don't really start allocating funds to the holiday season at any point during the year, do you? So one of the only things you'll do it for is staffing. Okay. If you have like temporary staffing that you bring on every holiday, you may start allocating a little bit extra. You may start keeping a little bit extra in the bank and say, you know what, we're going to reduce our buy budget a little bit because we want to make sure that our staff is appropriate for the season. Yep. And that's one of the big things hand to mouth larger whatever you're going to want to make sure you have the money available for that increased staff workload um so that's one thing that i have seen some shops be like all right look we're going to set aside you know five hundred dollars every month and at the end of the year come november december that's going to be our holiday help Mm -hmm. cool okay and then the last question is do you Slant your inventory orders to distro or displays more towards the layperson. Absolutely, you almost have to. 
Um, especially like I touched on, you know, Amazon exists yep. and it's a lot easier to find what you want on Amazon. So you want to slant your inventory to be eye catching. You want it to be friendly to the person that walks in. And one of the biggest things is obviously you want to make sure your staff is on point because the big difference between the LGS and Amazon besides the prices is the staff, the knowledge, the help and the customer service. And that's especially for the holidays. The most important thing you can do is have that good staff, but you can't get the staff in unless you have an eye catching display that appeals to the lowest common denominator of clientele. Yep. Okay. And you know, that pretty much answers all the questions that we picked up. Is there anything that you think we missed or anything you want to touch on in particular? Uh, I think one of the big ones is a lot of shops actually do a holiday tournament where they will have like a bigger tournament. Like there was a, not too long ago, there was a shop out here that did a 2k mm -hmm. for modern. That was like, Hey, here's our holiday jam. And it was, you know, capped it. I think it was like 50 people or something like that. Uh, so, you know, real high roller event, yep. fine, whatever. But a lot of shops try to do that to drum up at least getting their regulars in for one day mm -hmm. and try to get them in to like, take advantage of your single sales take advantage of your holiday sales or even sell you cards for way less than they would have sold them to you for three months ago. And that's just kind of part of the holiday marketing for a lot of LGSs is trying to get that event in. Okay. Yeah. And that, I guess that applies to all verticals of which they can bring players in for. So you have your tabletop, yeah. your card gamers, board gamers, etc. Okay. Yep. And it, it's an interesting marketing technique that I don't think I've seen employed that often. So, yeah. Interesting. Um, are you ready? Anything else before I head into picks then? Let's hit the picks. All right, cool. Uh, you went first because it just dovetailed nicely, so I'm going to take over this week. I'll hijack. Go for it. So I am going with Academy Manufacturer from Modern Horizons 2, a card that's been in my pocket for a couple of months now. And, you know, we can see on stocks that it's just kind of pretty flat overall. It's sawtooth over the last, like, you know three four weeks and we're uh, just kind of riding a a market rope again but to go with all my other modern horizons picks we're looking back at this because not only has it actually been trending up slightly but modern horizons 2 is ending its lifespan at distro we're coming up on uh, the dry season so to speak we're not really going to see much if not any more of this so Overall, I just really like the card for EDH. The to it's got token utility for any number of reasons, as each token provides its own unique bit of value. Um, overall, they can be applied to further some powerful strategies. It, thus, it's a pretty wide appeal across most or all color combinations, right? You're hard-pressed to find any single color or color combination that can't make either a clue, a food, or a treasure at this point and time in the game. And right now, we're just limited based on the last uh, since Shadows over Innistrad is when we got clues like that amount of yep. time but they keep pumping out these three tokens food maybe not so much because it does like slog down the games but you know we're seeing more and more of this more and more of these token generators as time goes on so because we're generating three types of tokens as I mentioned food treasures and clues this card has wide appeal in EDH on the whole and everything from control to combo and combo can be like Rakdos Sacrifice style decks or Jun Sacrifice whatever you want to look at or things like Mechanized Production and Revel and Riches which just win off a sheer number of tokens and then you have cards like Old Gnawbone that came out in AFR Goldspan Dragon which hit in uh, the set before AFR I can't remember off the top of my head and Inspiring Statuary like these all play into these uh, these tokens and the improvised mechanic as a whole. You can play any kind of game you want with with the cards that basically pump this up. Dub, uh, you have doubling season, similar elk and green. You have additional red cards that make more treasures over time. There's some synergy in black as well. They all play a fantastic role alongside manufacturers there's no strategy that can't be turbocharged to almost an immediate victory and doubling effects like this can be found again across most colors um, 
with clue and treasure tokens looking to be evergreen now the chance for additional synergies and strategies grows with each each new commander legal release so overall with modern horizons 2 production winding down stock dwindling like we talked about we should see the price continue to grow at a reasonable and smooth rate over the next six months or so the increase in price on both buy lists and the open market is something i really like seeing but having both risen the same amount a whole 50 cents i would expect that if we get in now our out to buy list is probably close to nine months because they're lockstep there's a very good chance really that if stock of this card plummets on the open market we'll see buy list again move in lockstep but with a price increase we should uh, we would need a demand driver for that to happen and we've already seen this hit uh, across multiple commander content sources and eventually we'll be able to out to buy lists so that puts pressure on a card from a yet unreleased product to push us up and while i don't doubt that this would happen again see old nabo and goldspan dragon i'm hesitant to think that it would happen in kamigawa those streets of new Capenna could be a likely spot so again if stock plummets on the open market we'll see buy list move in and lockstep but with that price increase we're going to need a demand driver to see buy list increase even in a lockstep movement so if you get in later rather than sooner you're going to require that driver if you get in now you can just ride that you can just ride it out into infinity and beyond so all this to reiterate that i would buy now just to toss us in a box to be reviewed in six months but expect to get out in nine and there's really not a lot to show with this card you take a look at stocks and it's just all over the place and what you can play that's kind of the beauty of this card and what it does uh I do want to note that there are two additional cards that I think are extremely powerful alongside this, and to me they didn't seem to be terribly obvious because they just kind of float along in um, like the artifact theme, and it's Storm the Vault, which is a flip card from Akoria that flips yeah. into Talarian Academy, Yeah. and so I'd pay attention to that, and uh, Shimmer Dragon, tap two artifacts, draw a card. Yeah. So as you're sitting there, just you know, shotgunning tokens onto the board, these two cards play very well into this. And now they are both locked to blue, which is a fairly popular color to pair alongside Manufacturer because you have Urza, so you can make all everything tap for mana. That's basically where you're going to make all your contra constructs, etc. But you're not necessarily locked in. There's a lot of synergy throughout, and this is the card that I just see getting better over time. It makes three types of tokens, which is extremely difficult to balance in standard, so I don't really see it coming back there. If it did come back in a commander set, again, limited release, and I think just the open market will gobble up that quantity. Um, as far as historical data goes, this has been on my list for about four months. The CK bi uh, buy list quantity has gone up by over 100. The buy list number has only increased by 50 cents. And on the open market, we've seen an increase by, uh, of man almost like 50 percent increase of quantity on the open market but the market price has also gone up about 50 cents and we're just seeing it max out on the available sales data on the tcg player page so if you were to look at the quantity sold per day it maxes out this card is just selling i think when you talk about timeline to me one of the most important things is like obviously like you said i don't think we're going to get any of these in kamigawa necessarily we could in streets to me the hit spot at the absolute worst timeline wise is dominaria and brothers war yep. because i can absolutely see treasure and clue taken clue tokens making a comeback there because it's all about artifacts right yep. clues treasures you know they were digging around trying to find the meek stone and the might stone and they did and there's your Vorthos moment for me. I'm a sucker for the Brothers War, so sue me. I have the sketch for Planar Collapse. It's one of the most important moments in the history of the storyline. Anyways, tangent aside, uh, I think that makes it very, very good, especially because, like you said, MH2 is basically dried up. We've reached peak open here. There may be some people getting them as gifts for the holidays mm -hmm. that open boxes. Cool. That's not going to have a huge effect on the supply or the price, and I think based on what we saw with bulk cards from mh1 the following summer is a really good time for those cards to start taking off and you have academy manufacturer 
combined with the Dominaria release and the Brothers War release, and I think that's a really good timeline yeah, for that. That's why I, I think it's going to be nine months. I, I was looking at yeah. set releases, and I, I, I had the same thought. Was We're yeah. going to go back to Just, Dominaria and the Brothers War, which are eternally tied to artifacts. Yeah, I, there, there's... Hey, and you know what else art, things that are eternally tied to artifacts are? Uh, banned every single yes. time. There's some card that needs to be banned. No, no, no. See, you don't ban Workshop. You just restrict every artifact that's legal and vintage. No, restrict Workshop. Unrestrict everything else. Format's fixed. <laughs> I mean, it's not really fixed, but that would be way better. I mean, look, then I could play Bazaar. I know. It would be amazing, right? Yeah. If only. Uh, all right. My pick, a little bit more traditional for me. Uh, fork. Why? Well, look at the price trajectory on MTG stocks. This card never bumped up with a reserve list. Well, it bumped up, but it wasn't like it took off to the moon like everything else did. All of a sudden, earlier this year, this card took off to the moon for the first time. Started roping down, and we're back and forth, back and forth, and now we're at just about a low of around $35, $40. So it's a little bit pricier to get into, so I wouldn't get more than probably about 4 or 5 But... This is inevitably going to take off again with the next reserve list because now we have this price history with yeah. it. We have this example of, all right, it takes off with a reserve list. Have they reprinted this card basically a number of times, even though they don't allow functional reprints? I mean, sure. to be fair, Reverberate did get a lot of people real angry with Watsy. Yeah. It's, uh, uh, Wild Ricochet was the best of those, oh, by the way. Oh, look, Wild Ricochet is great because... It has buyback. Yeah. Like, hands down, the, the best version of Fork. I don't care. I'll pay four extra mana for Fork with buyback. But, yeah. like, Reverberate what is... Or... There's Reverberate, Twin Cast. There's all kind. The, the, real, the only real difference is that Fork remains red. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fork is an exact copy, but the spell remains red. Yeah, Reverberate is an M11, M12, M13 in the Fire V Lightning deck, which essentially keeps the price of Fork down. Yeah. Or did. Did. And again, the nature of the reserve list is cyclical. It's going to go up. It's going to have a new floor. It's going to go up. It's going to have a new floor, probably for as long as this game is around. And now we have this historical price trend for Fork. It is, you know, if if Penny stocks like Grim Feast can hold a price of five dollars after spiking there is no reason fork should not have that mm -hmm. as far as timeline goes you're looking for tax season that's historically another time where we see a little bit of a reserve list bump you can get in now i'm not saying it's going to hit a hundred dollars again like it did earlier this year but i could certainly see it hitting that 60 to 70 dollar range where you can start profitably buy listing to card kingdom or any number of other websites or at the very least trade it out for a profit mm -hmm. especially because come that time of year fingers crossed we'll start to see a circuit return yep we'll start to see nature finding a way for large events to happen <laughs> thanks jeff goldblum uh so i i just think this is a solid market trend to pay attention to because this is to me this is a much higher impact much more iconic and visible card than the vast majority of the reserve list spikes we've seen. Yep. And it had never spiked prior to 2021. It had seen a little bit of a bump here and there, but it had never had the same surge that the rest of the reserve list did. And now we have that. So this is an opportunity we're paying attention to market trends. All of a sudden we have a chance to make a large amount of profit in a couple of months here. Uh, again, I always like the uh, picks that actually have more of a purpose to them than just, hey, buy in sell later profit and I, I think it's important to realize it's not like a lot of people talk about fork because it, no. it's not glitzy it's not glamorous it's not wheel of fortune you know like literally the only other red card from the reserve list i think people would want to play in commander yeah and it always seemed weird that it never saw the same trends that everything else did. it just kind of lagged behind unnecessarily and now that we're finally seeing it 
catch back up this does kind of serve as that signpost moment of like this is slash was an iconic card on the reserve list more so than a lot of other items on the reserve list and if you don't believe me read the reserve list yeah and there's still you know money to be to be made here there's still some items that are lagging that shouldn't be uh, i think yeah uh, another one that followed the same trend but took longer is vesuvian doppelganger yeah another it, it recently spiked for the first time even though it's reserve list and that card is incredibly iconic yep, yep. hugely iconic uh not as useful as fork but better than Jacques Lever. Significantly. And Jacques can take off all the time. Apparently. Whatever. Yeah. So dumb. Yeah. So dumb. there there's it's a, a great point to bring up and another great signpost pick, so two thumbs up for me. I try. Yep. But I think that's gonna close out this episode unless just unless there's anything else you want to mention about the LGS. Nope, I think we're good. All right. So, uh, for at, at MTG Cabalcast on Twitter, Patreon, Facebook, and YouTube, I am at Halt, I am Reptar. I am at Thirsty Sizzler. We'll see you next week.